All right. Uh, this is Anthony Padua, Rad Trad, and I'm here today with Ian from this channel, Early Christian Beliefs. Uh, Hello. I wanted... Morning. Morning, Ian. <laughs> I wanted to uh, talk about this uh, topic of, of Genesis, the, early, the six days of creation, uh, the age of the earth, and maybe other topics that might come up. Uh, in this discussion uh, with Ian, uh, he did a well. You did a, how many videos have you done in in regards to this? Well, I've done three, but uh, two of them are private, and uh, I just have one right now. It's that's up. It's almost an hour and twenty minutes, and it's intended to be a f somewhat exhaustive uh, proof. I've got twenty nine different fathers, and the whole thing is to just show that from the period of Christ up to Pope Leo, Pope St. Leo the Great, the fathers were unanimous in understanding Genesis as literal history. Okay, um, as literal history. When when you speak about literal history, like what, do you, what, do, what does that mean necessarily? Like it's like we're going back in time and looking at a recorder or what, what, do you know what, mm -hmm. what they mean necessarily when they speak about literal history? Yeah, so they some of them and uh, would understand things uh, a little differently. Like there wasn't a complete unanimity on every single issue, but what they were unanimous on is that the books of Moses were written by Moses. They were inspired. They were absolutely true. And textual variants aside, they considered it a point of faith that we believe them to be so true that we can construct a chronology of the history of the entire universe that will get us, you know, pretty close. And there was a little bit of disagreement as there even is today on how to crunch the numbers, say from the time uh, that Moses came into Canaan until the Exodus. There was a couple different schools of thought on that. Uh, There's a couple different schools of thought on how to crunch the numbers for judges. And then there's some textual variants. But all in all, we're talking about plus or minus about 400 years. Other than that, it's it's set in stone, and all the fathers, without exception, believe that. Believe that that you can you can date the 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 creation of the world back to a specific amount of years or whatnot. Yes, and and also that the creation of the world is. Uh, happened at the same moment as the creation of time. So they didn't believe, oh yeah, the world is 6,000 years old, but the universe has been around for, you know, 8 billion years. Nobody talked about that. And the concept of uh, millions and billions of years, and even the concept of infinite time for matter to exist infinitely, were both things that they argued against extensively in their apologetic works. And um, and the, the idea of having a historic chronology for the universe and the Bible recording uh, the, the actual length of its existence were, for the early Christians, a big part of their apologetics. So they felt like it was very important when they talked to unbelievers that had different views, who maybe believed in millions of years, they maybe believed in just you know, hundreds of thousands of years, whatever they believed, one of the first things a lot of the apologists bring forward is the fact that, hey, we've got a book that tells you the actual real answer. And because it's older than everything else, because it all goes back to the Tower of Babel when we all split apart as people groups, mm -hmm. they're history has been kind of decaying since then and adding in other myths, lies, demonic deceptions. We have the real truth. We have Genesis, Exodus, Joshua, Judges, all this. And this tells you the real history. And so it's important for you to understand that so that you can convert and become a Catholic. I think that's interesting um, that they use this as as an apolo as an apologetic to try to win over the pagans and mm -hmm. so forth, you know I, I I've talked to you before that when I when I converted to Catholicism, 
uh, I was under the impression that the Catholic Church taught evolution as a dog, as a fact, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because that's all I ever heard from these uh, apologists, such as uh, on Catholic Answers and so forth, that they pretty much said, yeah, yeah evolution's true. I mean, you don't have to believe it. They make you out like like you're you're like a, a knuckle dragger, you know. If you mm -hmm. if, if you hold to what I would hold to, which is a six day six day little six day creation on Earth, uh, that if you hold to something like that, you're just some Neanderthal, you know. Yeah, <laughs> like I, just, I've I've definitely encountered uh, that attitude as well, and I'd say, you know, I'm I'm just a layman, so I'm not by any means telling people trying to say i'm prescribing what you can and can't believe you need to talk to a valid priest as for what the parameters of belief are but i came to the catholic church through my studies of the early christians particularly saint vincent of lorenz was one of my favorites and it really troubled me for a long time as a protestant the high regard he held for the popes and so um, I guess I, I'm just saying that by saying that, you know, for me, if the fathers are unanimous on something, then I accept it. And, and that's why I'm a traditional Roman Catholic today is because of that. So, you know, I think it's too bad that there are other opinions out there that people are passionately defending who are also Catholics. Um, but nonetheless, I, I think my the video that I have out right now is just should be just an abundant amount of proof that that at least in the first four centuries, this was the unanimous position. And so the other views, you can't trace it back to the fathers. They came into the church from somewhere else. And in my way of looking at things, that's always a bad thing. You know, uh, yeah, so. When when I was you know coming to the church and was hearing these apologetics, is I I thought that there it was like a, the mind that it was such an odd view. I, they they would under they would at least explain it as a way that you have to read Genesis, you know, like the fathers read Genesis. You know, they would they would use yeah. this kind of argumentation, right? So yeah, they would say, well, you have to understand Genesis is not written in its history it's like poetry or it's whatever mm -hmm. so you have to understand it in the way that the early writers meant to for it to be written mm -hmm. and i'm like okay uh, i mean i guess i can understand that like if, if moses wasn't uh intending to explain it in a historical manner then okay but what i discovered is that the early the early writers that talk about Genesis or even even like Josephus and others mm -hmm. didn't understand it in the way I hear, you know, uh, modern day Catholic apologists speaking about Genesis or even in my own background, <clears throat> excuse me, in my own background as a Presbyterian, they would, there was a popular view of like a, as a framework hypothesis mm -hmm. so that they would, you know, they would see Genesis as speaking about this it's not literal. It's this, you know, they, I, I can't even remember the frame of Boston where it's like day one and day four maybe coincide. And it's like this kind of poetic parameter. But what it is, it, it, it's not literal. What No matter what you say, it's not literal. And that's not how it was meant to be interpreted. But when you look at what, some, like fi, maybe even Philo, I can't remember, or even some of these other early uh, Jewish writers, they were asking the same kind of questions we're asking today. Mm -hmm. Like, where did, uh, where, where you know, where did that, uh, uh, like where did the ch Adam's children get their, get their wives, you know, yeah. there are these people on the earth, you know, things like that. They're asking very common, basic questions that we're asking. So is that something you noticed that, they, that they didn't understand, they weren't reading Genesis the way it seems like these modern apologists who are, you know, are very sophisticated mm -hmm. <laughs> are reading Genesis. Did you, is that how it, what you experienced in your, in yeah. your looking at these people? At the yeah, and there's and there are let's just there's, there's a lot of scholars that are just way smarter. I won't speak for you, but they're a lot smarter than me. Uh, but I believe that they kind of have outsmarted themselves on this issue, because while the fathers have this just inexhaustible, inexhaustible well of just beautiful allegory and deeper meaning in the scripture <clears throat> and 
we would be fools to stop. And I think would be in fact condemned by the fathers. I think that can be explicitly shown if we just look at it as a history and we don't dive into what the, the depth of this pool that's been given for us from the church, this cave full of just treasure uh, for all the meaning of Genesis and Joshua and Judges and all of our sacred history. And then, so what happens is then they get this sleight of hand where they go, and that's the real meaning. Well, on, on one level, I can agree with them. That, that is the main point is the prophetic is the spiritual application, but you may not. And I think even very recent popes would agree, and the fathers are explicit, you may not reject the literal interpretation. And they all are very clear that you can construct a chronology that is literally true from it. So so that, that to me is the problem that people, they yes, they have Oh, you know, we're going to look at the better part is the spiritual application and all of the prophecy that's been fulfilled. Yes, but I would advise people if somebody tells you that that's what was intended, I can tell you for a fact that the fathers would disagree. And I actually would like to issue a challenge. Uh, I'm going to feel free to contact me in the comments on this video, or you can go out to my channel and uh, email me personally, I, I would like to find, is there any canonized saint that has ever specifically denied that Genesis is literal history or that has specifically said they believe in millions or billions of years, a canonized saint? And yes, I'm well aware that there are three fathers that believed in an instantaneous creation. They nonetheless still held dogmatically to a literal history. So that's that's not what I'm referring to. So uh, before we get into maybe some quotes uh, on some of these things, what, what, so just to clarify, what you're saying is that from your research, at least in the first, uh, how many hundred years is this of the church? Well, basically about 430 years after Christ. And there's not any magic line there. That's why I'm picking, like, I know a lot of heretics will say, well, after the Council of Nicaea, you can't believe anything you read because the whole religion changed. And I used to kind of fall into that camp. And I've left uh, left that camp and came over to, to God's camp. But I draw the line at 460 basically because that's where I've just focused my collection at. And I find it interesting. So I can't find anyone in that time period. And I, I'm wondering if there's anybody at any point that's a canonized saint who's ever said explicitly, that they believe that the universe is millions of years old or that Genesis was intended to be only an allegory or only a theological framework. All right. So you, so, so to summarize, you're, you're saying that from from your studies and maybe the quotes we're going to look at, that these particular early saints and fathers understood Genesis, Genesis to be literal history and that the earth to be young. Yep, they they basically, so in the time period that I'm looking at, everyone still used the Septuagint. Um, we kind of have Jerome bringing in uh, the Jewish timeline, which we're familiar with in the Vulgate now, and the Protestants uh, followed that, uh, which would make it a bit shorter. But, but the people I, I've all looked at and studied, and I have not been able to find documentation from, excuse me, uh, they would all say it's between Five, well, at the time of Christ, that the universe was between 5,199 years old. That's the lowest number, and that would be Eusebius of Caesarea. And then the highest number is 5,594 years old. That would be Clement of Alexandria. So everyone else falls in between those two numbers, and that would put us at about basically about 7,500 years of existence for the universe now, if, if, um, if we follow those timelines. Uh, why, why do you think that, why, why, do, you, why, why do you think that people, like let's say the modern apologists are hesitant to accept this notion? 
that the earth is like why do they uh, accept the notion that the earth is young or that they that the world was created in six days why do you think that they're they're hesitant like they 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 tend to label that opinion as protestant mm -hmm. i've heard that they tend to label that opinion as protestant uh i'm just curious what you like my, my thoughts my thoughts on this is i'll just say my thoughts on this is that i think they want to not look stupid to the world uh yeah i Personally. think that's that's it and i and i think one reason satan has made it easier for this opinion to put pressure on people is our fathers who are in my opinion our betters uh yeah. they lived in a world where it was after the fall of tower of babel and you had the Babylonians saying one thing, you had the Greeks saying another, the Romans had their view, the Egyptians had another, and there were other schools out there. This kind of some of the main ones, and they all differed. But here we are at the end of times, and we've got the one world internet, we've got a one world educational system, and we've got probably most importantly, we've got a one world media. And it just wraps us in this blanket, in a unanimous view from the world. If you question the uniformitarian, evolutionary, whatever you want to call it, timeline, then you're a moron. You will never get published in a serious paper. You will get laughed at. You will be mocked. And that, let us not underestimate the amount of pressure it puts on us. It's not just modesty standards and everything else. I mean, it, it comes into the world of theology and that's, of course, Satan's primary goal is to cor to corrupt the teachings of the church. I mean, that, that, I mean that's my, my, this is my thoughts is that, I mean, I, I think that they, they, because it seems to be some of the things they'll say, like I'll hear them say, well, that it makes Catholicism look bad if you, if you're out there spouting a six day creation. I think they want to make the, the pro so they have no problem saying, Oh, that's a Protestant view of the process. Mm -hmm. You know, but we, we, we're, you know, we, we hold up, we uphold science. So, you know, we uphold these things. And I, I, that's just, my, my opinion is I think that they're, that they're, that they are scared to look silly to the world, which I, but, mm -hmm. but I, I remember, I was, so I'm reading, I was reading over, uh, and we'll get in some of these quotes in a minute. In a minute. I'd like to hear the quotes of, of these fathers first, but I was reading over, uh, Humani Generis from uh, Pope uh, Pius the Twelfth, and he mentions. I was surprised at some of the things he actually says about evolution. You know, and I'll, I'll mention some of the things he calls it uh, pantheistic. The notion mm -hmm. that evolution is continuing. Uh, what, what do you say? He says uh, this is in part five, in chapter five of his encyclical. He says some imprudently and indiscreetly hold that evolution, which has not been fully proved even in the domain of natural sciences, explains the origin of all this, and audaciously support the monistic and pantheistic opinion that the world is in continual evolution. Yeah. Yeah, so he calls it, he also says in number six, so such fictitious tenets of evolution, which repudiate all that is absolute, firm, and immutable, have paved the way for new erroneous philosophy, and he connects evolution with communism. Yeah. Okay. So he calls it fictitious. He calls it pantheistic, and then Pius the Twelfth says in the, in chat in ten, section ten, which I thought was interesting, is that the kind of what we were just addressing here. He says, however, although we know that Catholic teaching generally avoids these errors, uh, speaking of other errors that he was mentioning as well as evolution, uh, it is apparent, however, that some today, as in apostolic times, desirous of novelty and fearing to be considered ignorant of recent scientific findings, try to withdraw themselves from the sacred teaching authority and accordingly, and are accordingly in danger of gradually departing and so forth. So this is nothing new, I guess. No. <laughs> I, was, I was reading this, I was like, <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, some of the some of these people in the leadership of the church are uh, don't want to appear ignorant to the world and to the yeah. system of, of this uh, evolutionary system. So yeah. they're, they're, they want to reconcile you know this this atheist fairy tale with uh, with with cat with 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 the church's teaching. Yeah. So and so and so uh, yeah. I just I, I found this interesting. So we're gonna get into some of these quotes. I, I want to mention that because 
I don't ever hear them say this of these apologists, like that mm-hmm. this is how Pius XII look spoke of this of the view of evolution because, yeah. like he spoke of it in a very negative way. He allowed uh, it to be looked at in one specific area, and uh, oh, it, it was uh, where was it at? I think it was in the area. The specific area was in the area of if our human bodies came from other from, from somewhere else. Like yes. No, yeah. So there's something like I can't remember. Um, but I do remember uh, that, yeah. If, if I if I believe you're correct, he was some kind of research. Yeah, was, yeah. He, he was studying a, by scholars is what he was talking about. You can look into these things, and kind of get back to me. Was yeah, the question I got from it? It's in chapter thirty six of his encyclical. It says, it "says for these reasons, uh, the teaching authority of the church does not forbid that, in conformity with the present state of human sciences and sacred theology." research and discussions on the part of men experienced in both fields take place with regard to the doctrine of evolution in as far as it inquires into the origin of the human body as coming from pre-existence living matter. And then he says, there's certain things that the Catholic faith obliges us to hold to. You know, he talks a little bit about that and he condemns the notion that Adam represented a tribe or something, you know, yeah. he, 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 he outright condemns that. So he says, We'll allow to look into this specific issue here mm-hmm. in this one specific area, you know, but, he, but the, the whole notion of evolution itself as, as that, we're, that the world is in continually evolving and creating more different various forms of creatures about whatever through natural, it's all rejected by, apparently it seems by, by Pope Pius XII. Yeah. And, and I, I've got a couple of thoughts on that. One is, um, you know, in the last 80 years since that was written, I mean, the, the understanding at that time of science, of what evolution was, was in a relatively primitive state compared to how far we've come now. Yeah. I mean, the whole idea of ge- of genetic material having positive mutations has been debunked. There's no such thing as a positive mutation. Um Molecules to man evolution has been debunked. The whole carbon dating stuff has all been debunked. So, so the primitive understanding of evolution that they had at that time has been pretty well debunked. So um, that's one thing. And, and then another uh, one that I think is kind of interesting is that St. Peter of Alexandria, uh, who was, I believe, the mentor of Athanasius of Alexandria, Saint Athanasius, they're both saints. Um, he specifically says that you cannot believe that man was created from some pre-existent type. So again, there's nothing new under the sun. They they dealt with all these same errors that we have to deal with today. I think, but like I said, the difference is it's a monolithic antichrist front that we're facing now all right um yeah i agree uh, um let's, let's look at some of the maybe some of the quotes you have regarding let's say um <clears throat> the days of creation <clears throat> excuse me so what uh maybe give us some give us uh some summary some some quotes on what some of the fathers or some of the ancients yeah uh, believed about the six days itself and then we can discuss those a little bit. Okay, well, to start with, we'll get the uh, the opposition out of the way. So oh, there's been a lot of, of lot made lately uh, in books and on YouTube about the fact that the Alexandrian school, which you mentioned, Philo of Alexandria, he was a great Jewish teacher in Alexandria who has lived at the same time as Jesus. I think he died shortly after Christ did, our Lord. Um, that their school of th- thinking was very allegorical, and they did view the days of Genesis as happening in a single instant. So one moment in time, a twinkling of the eye, boom, and all six days were done. That was followed by St. Clement of Alexandria. Origen seems to have followed it. Um, he's frequently quoted, but I actually... After reading a bunch of his stuff, it's like, eh, he's pretty vague about it, actually. And then uh, uh, St. Augustine, most notice, notably, who leaned very heavily on the Alexandrian fathers for a lot of his allegorical teaching. He kind of tried to defend it there. And um, 
but he even express, expressed some hesitation in his view. So if, if you want to say, well, that was a minority view, I think Catholic principles would say we throw that out. Um, but if, if you really want to dig your heels and fall, follow them, then that, all that allows you to do is take your, your length of time that you have for the age of the universe and uh, snip six days off of it. And you make the, the universe that much shorter. Um, everyone else believed that does speak on the matter, all believed in uh, literal days. And there's two basic ways that that's expressed. One is expressed in the fact that the fathers believed that the six literal days of creation are recapitulated in 6,000 years until the coming of Christ. So that Christ would come during the 6,000th year. And then after that 6,000th year, you'd have a millennium or a church age, which in my opinion was very nicely fulfilled. We had the church reigning on earth, a reign with Christ as king and the saints during what we call the middle ages. And there's different timestamps you could look at for that. But so they believed in six days recapitulated as uh, 6,000 years. I'll just read one here real quick from Lactantius. Therefore, since all the works of God were completed in six days, the world must continue in its present state through six ages. That is 6,000 years. And then he goes on to talk about the 7,000th year that the, the saints will reign with Christ. So I think I've got about a dozen different fathers I've found. And we're talking... Lactantius is not a saint. He's very well educated, but we've got, you know, St. Hilary of Pontiers, many saints that are also doctors of the church uh, that teach that position. And then uh, there's a number of other ones that kind of getting later on. And this is uh, that specifically say that it was a 24 hour day. The earliest of, is Theophilus of Antioch, who's second century. But uh, the other ones that started really stating and pounding home that the days were 24-hour days, I think, I think it's interesting that they were doing so about the time that the Originist controversy, the first Originist controversy was going. So people are starting to push back against the Alexandrian school and their over-allegorization of stuff. Lots of stuff. And it wasn't just the days of creation. They were taking a lot of stuff and saying it's only an allegory. We can't understand this literally. And there were eventually some condemnations, uh, but mostly just a bunch of scandal about it. And so some of the fathers started pushing back. And that's when you start getting these real clear statements of how long it was. So here's, here's one from St. Basil the Great. He's bishop and doctor of the church. And he says, under the form of history, the law is laid down for what is to follow. Now, 24 hours fill up the space of one day, we mean of a day and of a night. Thus, every time that in the revolution of the sun, evening and morning occupy the world, their periodical succession never exceeds the space of one day. So he's he's clear it's 24 hours. So, and I'm sure we've got a multitude of um, people that will say similar things. What? One of the critiques I hear about this is the notion that the sun was made on the fourth day, so you couldn't have a 24-hour period because, you know, there was no sun or moon or whatever. Yeah. So do you know, are there any, any um, mm -hmm. fathers that address that? Do you have any of those yeah. uh, available? Yeah, and that would uh, that actually kind of comes into play to the quote I just read, because he says, "In the revolution of the sun, evening and morning occupy the world. Their periodical succession never exceeds the space of one day." So from that quote, you could even go, "Okay, so he's not talking about the first three days, right? Because the sun was created on day four. So so that quote there, he, he's not specifying the length of time for the first three days because we had no sun." But he's, this is actually in his discussion of the first day. And the bigger, the bigger question he's dealing with here is how did we measure time 
before we had the sun. And his point in this quote is saying that it's the same period of time as what we currently have. You know, a lot of the a lot of the things that these fathers say, it's it, it's a trick to keep the meaning correct, get sound bites that you can pre present in a in a video setting uh, and still get the idea across. Because a lot of the people, their their sentences are long, their thoughts are interwoven. It doesn't uh, translate well to sound bites. But here's one from Theophilus of Antioch. He was the seventh bishop of Antioch, and he wrote a one of the earliest chronologies we have of the world. And he wrote it to his friend to try to convert him. Um, hang on a second. You know, while you're looking that up, I, um, this reminds me of what you said earlier that this was used as an apologetic to teach the people that didn't know how the world was created or how it came into being, that we can actually trace back, that our writings can trace back to the origins of the earth and the world. I think that apologetic has somehow, somehow been lost now, it seems. Yeah. You know, we don't even, we certainly don't use that anymore, you know. So. All right. So, so here's Theophilus, like I said, trying to convert his friend. And he's talking about the fourth day is when the luminaries were created. So he says, quote, on the fourth day, the luminaries were made because God who possesses foreknowledge knew the follies of the vain philosophers that they were going to say that the things which grow on earth are produced from the heavenly bodies. So to exclude God in order, therefore, that the truth might be obvious the plants and seeds were produced prior to the heavenly bodies for what is posterior cannot produce what is prior. So that's, that's neat. That's, I actually really like that explanation that he was trying to. So, so because we're so prone to worship the, the sun, the moon, the stars, you know, the, the and, and, and attribute them to certain things. He taught that those plants were, were grew prior to these different items so that that way we don't tend to worship those items or whatever or like attribute them mm -hmm. to the growth yeah i think, and it, he, I think that's interesting and he and he specifically is saying here that it's saint theophilus uh is saying that it's because of the follies of vain philosophers that he mm -hmm. did it in this order so to point out the foolishness of men who would argue that, oh, you couldn't have had plants before the sun because the sun's required for life. And he's saying, no, God did that to point out what a fool you are for thinking that because his power is so great. That's a that's a very powerful point because that's the point. You hear this all the time. You hear that argument. But yeah. it, was, it was it was addressed. Well, if and if for these guys who say that, hey, we want to get into the deeper wisdom behind these Genesis teachings and we want to look at it from the standpoint of the fathers. Well, I invite you to, to adopt St. Theophilus's point of view. He's saying that if you can't accept the literal truth of Genesis, then you've been confuted. God has basically pump faked you to go down the wrong road because you don't have the faith to follow. That's what it seems to be that he's saying there. Wow. What a different mentality. <laughs> So, yeah, the, I, I that's why I love reading the fathers. It's it's like a whole different world. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there? Uh, so okay. So just to summarize what you're saying here with with these with these uh, sample quotes um, that they tend to see the six days of creation in a both literal. 24 hour period as well as a prophetic symbolic sense. Correct. Correct. Yep. And okay. in a prophetic sense of forecasting time forward, which is one of the ways they looked at it, but they had a number of different ways that they would look at it. Um, and maybe I could read one more where they're kind of taking one of the saints takes things down a little bit of a different road. But I think that the day age view that they had back then, which I'm calling it, maybe is confusing to call it that, but it's that they viewed a 24 hour day as a age of a thousand years, which was 
projecting the time until the coming of Christ uh, is important because uh, His Holiness, Pope Pius X, in his holy office uh, letters concerning under, how we're to understand the first three days of Genesis, says in there that a day can be understood either as a 24-hour period or as a longer age. So I think this is good because I've spoken to people who say, okay, well, I have permission, therefore, to view uh, the days of creation as a long age, and I choose in my liberty to view that time period as a billion years. So therefore, the universe, I believe, with the permission of Pope Pius X, to be six billion years old. And I, I think that that goes against the other points of the Holy Office letter, certainly goes against the fathers. They, they did not deny the basic laws of grammar. They viewed, yes, it can be an age. Lactantius used that word, an age of a thousand years. So, so you can view it as a long age and use that word in its many senses without rejecting uh, what the rest of what the fathers taught. But let me read this. Is, uh, this is a quote, uh, basically the transfiguration. This is from the oldest existent uh, Latin commentary on, on the Gospel of Matthew. It's from St. Hilary of Pontier's bishop and confessor. And this is what he writes. After six days, Peter, James, and John were taken apart from the others and brought to the top of a mountain. As they were looking on, the Lord was transfigured and resplendent in a brilliance of his garments. In this matter, there is preserved an underlying principle, a number, and an example. It was after six days that the Lord was shown in his glory by his clothing, that is, the honor of the heavenly kingdom is prefigured in the unfolding of 6,000 years. So, I, you know, it, it's a beautiful, a beautiful uh, allegorical interpretation of the transfiguration that Christ, the word of God, is shown in the flesh, in his clothing of the flesh, in this resplendent glory in the sixth day which is the prefiguring of the 6,000 years. But in order to understand what he's writing here, you'd have to already understand the common teaching. And, and it was clearly a very common teaching um, that the six days of creation, six days is 6,000 years. So he has two statements in that commentary that both show the fact that he could use this as an example to his readers with no explanation because it was the common understanding that the days of creation were 24 hour days and six 24 hour days equaled 6,000, six millennia, 6,000 years in which Christ would be manifest and was the common teaching of the Jews uh, is my understanding as well. So just to uh, summarize, re repeat, re say what you were saying is that for instance, like when St. Pius X was saying that, yes, it's true that the day there in Genesis can refer to a literal day and it could also refer uh, grammatically, whatever, to a time, an age or whatnot. It's, it's true because it, what you're saying is that the fathers understood it both to speak of, a, of literal six days, but then also mm -hmm. used it prophetically as an age of, prophetically in a, in a, in a age time whatever but like so they they used it one is in, in prophetically to speak of mystical events as well as the historical literalness so both are true it's just in its proper understanding of what you're of what i'm getting from this yeah and and i've got the i've got uh the holy office uh letter up here right now if people want to press pause and go grab your denziger and ring along read along it's uh 2128 in Denziger, and this is what it says. So these are posed as questions, and then the the uh, the answer comes back from the Holy Office, either affirmative or negative. So the question given is this: In the designation and distinction of the six days mentioned in the first chapters of Genesis, 
the word yom or day be taken in either a literal sense for the natural day or in an applied sense for a certain space of time? And may this question be subject to free discussion amongst exegetes? And the answer is yes. So the word day can have multiple meanings, even in the context of Genesis, and, and it can be uh, freely discussed without any condemnation. So yeah, you can discuss it and all that, but it's, it doesn't say, oh, you can, you can th totally throw out the literal meaning of Genesis as so saying, all the fathers. They're saying you can discuss it, but if you're going to be consistent with how the fathers and early saints of the church understood, they would understood it both as a literal six day period, as well as a prophetic picture of events to come. Yep. Basically. So yeah. if you, so you can take it in both ways, but if you want to be consistent with our patrimony, that's how you would understand it. Yep. I, 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 I that's how I would understand it to mean. And, uh, and, and so look, is there any, is there anyone that in the fathers, early saints, mystics, whatever, who denied, rejected the notion that the earth was, uh, six, uh, was was young or 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 let's say rejected the notion of a literal 24-hour period of genesis for the days yeah well as i mentioned earlier the clement of alexandria or origin of alexandria mm -hmm. and i assume there would have been others but these are the ones whose writings we have and augustine who believed in the literal or in a uh instantaneous creation okay so six days of creation or a single moment in time, but it was expressed for various allegorical reasons to have taken place over six days. And all three of those men are dogmatic in the uh, earth, the rest of the Bible being a literal history. And in fact, all three of them attack people that disagree with that, non-believers, Augustine's like, I don't know any any Christian that would be so audacious to question any of this, um, but he goes after different heretics. Uh, Origen specifically says that it's one it's an ecclesiastical principle of the church that we can calculate the length of the universe's existence from our scriptures. It's an ecclesiastical principle That's that must be held and that we all hold in common. And Clement likewise in his stromata and other places, attacks pagans. So, so they're the only ones that have any kind of a descent. But, you know, as uh, St. Vincent of Wren says, if you have one regional area where for a period of time there's a divergent opinion, you throw that out. You go with what the fathers have universally accepted. Um, there's a... Who, there's, who, is it that's, who is it that said that? Uh, that St. Vincent of Lorenz. Yeah. He, so he's saying he's saying that this school of thought here where St. Augustine and St. Clement were where they didn't hold to a six literal day, but a more instantaneous creation uh, was sort of like an anomaly with the rest of the the, the fathers all throughout spread throughout Christendom. Uh, just to be or clear, I, I maybe I rattled that off too quick. He doesn't address, St. Vincent of Lorenz does not address these issues really in any kind of meaningful way, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. But he lays down principles, and these are, it was mainly his works that compelled me to become a Catholic, and that principle that he lays down. So if you could show, let's say, a father, for instance, we've got some writings, excuse me, from St. Cyprian, where he definitely was not happy with the Holy See. And he throws out some pretty angry statements. Um, he makes some other statements where he's asking the popes to intercede in Europe and tell people to stop doing things uh, that he didn't agree with. So he definitely acknowledged the papal see. The principles of St. Vincent forced me to, to look at it and go, okay, because I've got some letters from this one father where he's unhappy. 
but I've got other ones where he's getting along with the Pope and he supports his, his jurisdiction more clearly. I can't go to and just pick out what I what suits my, uh, you know, as an Anglican, I was a traditional Anglican and go, well, that I like this. So I'm just going to like this and ignore all these other things. And that that's the principle I was pointing out, not that he addressed the issue directly, that we have only three fathers, to my knowledge, ever in church history that believed in instantaneous creation. And so therefore, but your your question was, did everyone believe in this in 24 hour days? Well, we have those three exceptions, but as far as I can tell, everyone else did. And even those three included and everyone else, the one thing that there is a 100% complete unanimity during the time period up to Pope St. Leo the Great is they all believed you could construct, construct a true chronology from the Holy Scriptures. And they, so okay, so they would, so even the ones, the three, um, the three dissenters in that regard, they would hold that okay that so the world was instant inst instantaneously created and history began at that moment correct right. time so began time, time began, began at that genesis 1 1. that was the beginning of all all time all matter was genesis 1 1. so there wasn't this billions of year gap between mm -hmm. let's say genesis 1 1 and 1 2 between genesis 1 1 and the time that adam was formed and yes. his history began the history of man began it was instantaneous pretty much there yeah. was no there was no and, billion year gap in between yeah and and um, saint augustine in the city of god explicitly attacks that idea that there was a long period of time and then adam was created you know five or six thousand years ago and he yeah. specifically names that and rejects that and i deal with that passage in my video all right, so so interesting. Um, now let me let me read a, another one from the Pope Pius X's Holy Office letter. Okay, now this one it would be uh, twenty one twenty four in Denziger, and it reads the following: In the interpretation of those passages in these chapters, which the fathers and doctors understood in different manners, without proposing anything certain and definite. Is it lawful without prejudice to the judgment of the church and with attention to the analogy of the faith to follow and defend the opinion that commends itself to each one? And the answer is to the affirmative. Now, I think a lot of people would look at this and go, well, I've got great latitude then in how I, I look at Genesis because the fathers and doctors most people believe have said very little about Genesis, but I would say that it's quite the opposite. They've been so specific. And what else I think is interesting here is that that is the limit that's being set out by, by the, by, by the Holy office here in, in Pius the 10th is that the, you have to understand it, how the fathers and doctors understood it and not breaking the analogy of the faith and where they had some differences, then, you know, maybe there is some room. Like, I'll, I'll give you an example for one difference. I read recently where in one place, uh, St. Ephraim the Syrian, who's a doctor of the church, said that the seeds were created on the third day, but they didn't blossom out till the fourth day when the sun came, which would seem to be different than a lot of the other fathers, uh, St. Basil and so many of the others talk about there was, you know, waving fields of trees and grass and all this right on the third day as the creation was made. So, you know, as far as just getting down into the absolute nitty gritty, are we just, you know, we've got this lengthy canon law sort of way that we have to look at every little detail in Genesis? No, but the broad strokes, yes, the church, at least, you know, and again, I'm not a priest. Ask, ask your priest what you may and may not believe. But to me, it seems like the intent of this Holy Office letter is to say you must stay within the bounds of the fathers. And and that's consistent with how we look at everything else. Yeah. Um, so, uh, let's, okay, so we, we'll kind of move uh, from the, the, the six days understanding. So it seems, at least from there, we kind of, 
the, the, the opinion that seems to be of the early Christians, uh, the fathers, so, so forth, is that you can, that it was six literal days, other than the exceptions, so those three exceptions, and that the, the, the day as well can be used prophetically, to, mystically, uh, uh, to speak about ages and times and large periods of times. But no one, no one took it as that there's this millions of year gap between the creation of the world and then Adam being formed. Yeah, that was com completely unanimous. And in, in fact, there's many, many dogmas that if you reject, you'll be anathematized and excommunicated that were not so clearly spelled out as their belief. Well, so I think that, so I think that's important. I, I, I want to just kind of bring that to the, to, to the fold that this is nothing. Well, so we're not the, we're, <laughs> we're not the oddballs, I guess, you know, this is not the oddball position. This is very consistent that we would, if you would hold to a young earth, a young earth view that uh, you would be very consistent in your, as a Catholic, Mm -hmm. to, to hold to such a thing that if you hold to an old earth view you would be sort of out of step yeah with with what at least has been addressed uh, by by the fathers um all right so let's see maybe we can talk maybe we can talk on do you, what let me ask this why, why do you do you think this is a an important issue to you know as, as opposed to like Hey, you know who cares? You know if you if mm -hmm. they believe a uh, if the, the Earth is trillions of zillions of years old, or that uh, you know humans evolved into what they are today, and then God imposed the soul or whatever. Yeah. You know what does it matter? Who cares? Like, do you find this? Why do you think this is important? Well, you know, first of all, there are some Catholics that I have very high regard for that are examples for me, that are mentoring me, training me who disagree with me on this issue. So just putting that out front, I'm not, uh, I'm not a priest, I'm not a PhD, and I, I'm not passing judgment on, on anybody's faith here. I, I know people that are just, you know, saintly, saintly men and women that would disagree on this issue. Um, but that being said, I, I think it was, if it was important to the fathers, and, and I think if they, understood Genesis unanimously in one sense. And the church seems to have held that up until very, very recently. I'm going to say sometime after Our Lady of La Salette is when this came in. Um, then it must be important to God. I mean, so much of the Bible is chronology. So much of the Bible is the calendar, the yearly calendar for the Jews. And for us as Catholics, we're in Lent right now. The, the events of the sacred cycle of the year, of days, of weeks, it's all so important. And it all comes from the six days of creation and the chronology of Genesis is where all of that was developed. And if you just look at it as pseudopigrapha or fairy tale, which I think is what you wind up doing, if, if you see it all as not intended to be history, then you essentially are saying that it in, a, in an indirect way, that that's pseudepigrapha, it's just myth. And that affects how we present it to the next generation. Yeah, I think, I think, that's, I think that's true, because if like, if you're gonna say that, uh, basically what, 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 what it tends to be doing is that you, you're allowing science to, to, inter, to, to form your theology or form your understanding of scripture. Well, can I disagree with Basically. you on that one? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I think it's the other way around. I think if you're if you're if you think that science is the reason to disagree with how the fathers looked at this, then you're letting naturalistic evolutionary theology affect how you look at science, because there's lots of scientists out there. Most of them are not Catholic, but there's lots of really good scientists that have just obliterated the evolutionary arguments. So it's, to me, I realize a lot of people will say it's a question of science. Okay, but I get what you're saying. When, when somebody's looking at me in the eye telling me that, I'm thinking in the back of my mind, no, it's not science because there's people that know 
a thousand times more about science than you do, yeah. who believe that the earth follows a biblical time frame. So to me, it's more about you've you've been duped into accepting a naturalistic, uniformitarian religious philosophy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I like that. I like the way you, like, like the way you put that. So basically, you're, you're allowing this evolution religion. Yes. To affect the way we view, the way we view our Catholic faith. And and science, and, and science, and both, yeah. And then, and then, so if you're saying, well, science, you know, don't make me choose between my faith and science. Well, I'm not making you choose between anything. You, know, you feel free to ignore me, but um, I don't believe that that's the case for anyone. Yeah, there's plenty of science out there. If people are ignorant of it, well, that's their choice. There's tons of it out there that yeah. show that the Bible's true, that what the fathers taught about the Bible is scientifically verifiable uh, from archeology, span you know, geography or geology, physics, you name it. All right. Um, we're getting about an hour in. I don't think I wanted to, I was, I was thinking about getting into the Nephilim and all that, <laughs> but I think that might, might be a little too much. Yeah, well, that will be, so I'm going to do, just to give you a little recap on kind of where I'm going with my channel. Sure. Uh, I, I didn't really start it out to do Genesis. My main thing is I want to reach out to people like me who were uh, Protestants that took some stock in the early church. And I really want to hit the sacraments, particularly holy orders, baptism, and communion. And so I'm working on that. But just since you brought it up, the Nephilim will have to get addressed because my next one in the Genesis series will be about the flood. And so that is discussed in what happened in Genesis 6 as uh, God brought judgment on the world. And that's one area where there is a div divergence of views. It's not a unanimous thing with the fathers. There are multiple opinions on that. And I will be discussing the evidence of for and against as far as just which fathers, I don't really think it's something that's critical. I don't care what people think about that, but I'm just going to say here, these fathers said this, and those fathers said that, and give you the quotes. And, and we're just, so, just out of curiosity, you're talking about di divergence in, in what regards? Uh, some of the fathers believed the position that's currently held by the church, at least as far as what I can see, uh, my Hadoc reference Bible gives it and the priests I've talked to. Uh, that the sons of Seth were considered to be the sons of God in Genesis 6, 4. Okay. And they, wickedness was propagated before the flood by them going and marrying the daughters of Canaan who slew Abel. They were a wicked, immodest people. And then that corrupted the goodness that was there and brought God to the point of destroying with the flood. Whereas the other view, which was fairly prevalent among the fathers in the early period, was that actual angels fell and actually had children with women that were these demonic monsters, giants, whatever you want to call them. And that their souls after the flood became demons and they still haunt us to this day. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Um, I think we'll, 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 we'll leave it with that. I think that was, this, I think about an hour is good enough. Um, okay. Well, it's been good chatting with you. Yeah, I think let's, uh, we can close this up by just kind of summarizing that at least, hey, uh, you know, if you're going to, you know, believe whatever, but <laughs> we're, we're, the, the idea that we that we hold to a, a young earth six day creation is certainly not odd. No, okay? it may be it may be odd with atheists. OK, but it shouldn't be odd among us as Catholics. No, so. we are definitely <laughs> permitted to believe it. And if you want to. Want, want to understand better why I think you should believe it, uh, look in the show notes. My The link to my uh, video on Genesis will be down there. Please check it out. Yeah, I will. I will. I will I'll put those. I'll put those in there, uh, Ian, as well. All right. I'm going to end this uh, recording. All right. God bless you.